Alaska Raceway Park has operated under many different names over the years. Polar Dragway, Polar Raceway, Thunder Valley, Polar Raceway Park, and finally, Alaska Raceway Park. It began as a result of the creative efforts and entrepreneurial spirit of Lee Nelson and his family back in the 1960s. Because of hard work by many dedicated people, it has become a first-class racing venue of which Alaskans can be proud. As long as man has been making vehicles of one type or another, he has been racing them. Alaskans are as competitive as anyone, maybe more so. The first recorded automotive race in Alaska was held in 1917 in Fairbanks at Exposition Park, now known as Weeks Field Community Park. The Matanuska Valley colonists were no strangers to car racing. Back in the 1940s, there was a dirt oval where the Palmer Pioneer home now sits. It reportedly hosted stock car races as a part of the Alaska State Fair. In May and August of 1963, Palmer hosted a downtown Grand Prix and drag races. A June 4, 1963 newspaper article tells of three different projects in the Matsu Valley to build racetracks. The first, a joint effort between the Palmer Chamber of Commerce, the Palmer Businessmen's Association, and the Alaska Sports Car Club, was to be built on 175 acres of the Springer Loop. The second project mentioned was a drag strip in the Wasilla Big Lake area, and the third was a lease option on a 155-acre parcel of land between Anchorage and Palmer. The races may have been the last road race event ever to be held in Palmer. A new sports car and other racing track layout is under construction and the racers expect to do their competition off the city streets next season. This article referred to the Springer Loop project. We're not sure how far it went or when it died. The Wasilla Big Lake track was never heard of again but the third was the Nelson family project, which turned out to be the one that succeeded. came out here in 1961 and 1962. They used to run all the races. Uh, they'd come out of Anchorage and come up here and out there by the borough, the highway going out past the borough, going out towards the uh, intersection with the Parks Highway. That road never went through before. That okay. stopped as you went down over the hill towards the hay flat. It was the end of the road. So they would go out here and bought, nobody lived out there. The, the, the state, the fair wasn't even out there yet. And they'd go out there and block off the road and, and put the drag races on because the state would let them, the city of Palmer would let them. Uh, we didn't have a burl at the time. So they'd go out there and they'd block it off. And they had no timing lights. Everything was a heads up race. And we just had fly guys out there and, then, and they would race down there. So we came out to a couple races. We were new up here, somebody said, you know, we got drag racing going out in Palmer. Let's go out and look at it. So we drove it. You got to drive around the old highway all the way around. Come into Palmer. You come in. You go out there. When we first came to Palmer and seen them drag race, I said, you build a drag strip, they'll be there. And we were looking for a piece of property. So we're looking at this, and then we decided that, you know, drive up the highway, see what we got going. And we leased uh, a one-quarter section. Quarter of a mile, a mile long, and a quarter mile wide. That's where the drag strip itself sits on that piece of property. Okay. Okay. And then we bought other property leading from the highway into it. We actually had to buy that property for the road going in. 
going, and we had to go across the Bodenberg uh, uh, Creek, so we had to put a bridge in there. So we oh, built geez. a bridge and the whole nine yards going in there. That was the only flat piece of land that we could find. And, and then we looked at it because it's full of trees. Barnhart's Mill bought all the trees that we cut down. That was a sawmill right there on uh, Plumley Road. So uh, we were looking for somebody to cut down the trees and uh, we was in Bear Run Building Materials and these two young guys came in there looking for a job. And we were yakking with them and got to talking to them and my dad says, you guys know anything about logging? And they go, oh yeah, yeah, we've done a lot. We're from Oregon, we've done a lot of tree cutting. And they said, well, we got a job for you. We need you to clear 300 feet by one mile. Just drop them and limb them. That's all you got to do. In spring of 1964, Lee Nelson hired Harold Forslund to do the grading and lay the asphalt. They had already cleared the trees and the stumps and all of that had been done the year before. So dad was hired to do the, the cat work and the final grade because he was a finished grader operator. So he took on the contract. He and another fellow, I don't remember the name of that one, but there were just the two of them. And then um, between mom being out here at night and helping him because she was always right there, uh, he did the cat work and the grader work and also the, laid the asphalt. And they started a bit late. It was a, it was a cold, bad winter. So in that short time, to get that done and then have opening on the Labor Day Labor weekend. Day. But he was that man that would work 24-7 around the clock and the daylight afforded him that. It, you know, he was out here at midnight doing what he had to do. The guy uh, uh, that uh, ran the operation out there was so, so gifted in all the equipment and the ability to shoot green and run all that stuff out there. It was, he was just a blessing. And uh, when he took that on, it was just like, wow, we can just walk away. When it came to doing the dirt work, it was on him. We had uh, three D8 cats, cable, you know, the old cable blades out there. We had two cable cans that were drug behind the D8 cats. We had two big cat 12 graders out there. So we had to buy all this stuff because we weren't in that business. We was in the house building business. And we had to buy a, a rock crusher to crush the, the three, quarter, three eighths minus to build to make the asphalt to put on the roof. It was a hot chip there. We put four coats of chips on that okay. track to start with, and that thing lasted for a long, long, long time. We put a slurry over top of the whole thing. So we okay. sealed all the chips with a uh, about a half inch slurry coat on that whole thing for the full length of it. The tower was the first thing that we built. We built the tower first and then we built the little hot dog stand. Originally it was just a concrete block thing with the pony walls up above it. Then we added the garages to it and then the room up on top of it. The opening day, Labor Day weekend, 1964, 64. when we opened the gates up, people were parked because we had the, the, the ticket gate out on, the, out on our road coming in. Right. And from there all the way out to the highway, I parked all, driving all the way out down towards the Butte. We had cars parked on the highway trying to get in. And when they came in, they filled up our parking lot, filled up the road going out to the highway, and they were parking on the highway and walking in. It was very crowded. The stands were full. They were all lined up along the track. The cars were lined up. There was standing room only. The bleachers were full. There were people just standing everywhere. You couldn't get another car in. I mean, it was packed. Governor Egan, he had a, quite an entourage came out with him uh, on that day, and he had the, the, uh, uh, the, the newspapers they came out and they ran the whole deal that day. Actually, he cut the ribbon on the drag strip. On opening day, the strip was safer than any street those guys had been racing on. The pits were a little rough, but the weather cooperated. State troopers used a radar gun to record the top speed in a quarter mile. It was Jim Moore's Corvette at 102 miles an hour. Labor Day was an exciting weekend for racing on the last frontier.
over the winter of 64-65, the Nelsons offered shares in Polar Dragway Incorporated and made it clear that they had big plans for the property, including go-karts, horse racing, motel, lounge, high-performance shop, and airstrip. The first few years were a learning experience for the Nelsons and the racers. Everybody was learning at the same time we were learning. The guys racing here, they never raced outside. They didn't know if we, you know, what had to be do, done next. So what needed to be done, we did. If something needed to be bought, we bought it. If something needed to be learned, we learned it. If something needed to be taken care of, we took care of it. Everybody, the racers would say, oh, you know, this, they're doing this outside. Well, what do we need to do here? So we'd figure out a way of doing it. So it wasn't that, you know, we didn't know what I, we were doing and they knew what they were doing. They didn't know what was going on either. So we were all learning at the same pace. For the first two or three years, the Nelsons recruited a few of the local car clubs to run the technical end of the track while they continued to improve the facility. These guys actually put the races on. They managed the races. They managed the timing lights. They managed the teching. So we hired these guys to come out there and work at the drag strip. Then we'd hire the ambulance guys to come out there and we'd have to hire security. We hired uh, off-duty uh, state troopers to come out there and run security for everything. But yeah, these guys would come out there, the car clubs actually um, did all of the programming for the racing. So after about the third year, we were in a professional mode where we had professional people doing their jobs, the racers doing what they do is race, and we ran the drag strip. I was doing the announcing out there for, I don't know, 10, 12, 14 years. Less than one year after Polar Dragway opened, another new drag strip opened on the south side of Anchorage where Independence Park is now located. It was immediately very popular with racers and fans. After all, they didn't have to drive all the way to the valley. To say that the Nelsons were nervous and upset is probably an understatement. For a number of reasons, Anchorage Dragway was short-lived and didn't reopen in 1966. For quite a few years after closing, it was used as a private airstrip. Between 1967 and 1969, Alaskan racers broke a number of records both at Polar and at some of the NHRA tracks in the lower 48. Some noteworthy record holders were Dale and Derry Snelson and Bill Sims, Clarence LeMay, Jim Moore, Bob Lunsford, Dennis Fowler. It has been said that in 1969, there were five NHRA record holders living in Alaska. Very early on, Polar Dragway caught the attention of the drag racing community outside. In December of 1967, Hot Rod Magazine printed a full three-page article about our now world-famous track. The article made special mention of the rivalry between Jim Moore and Clarence LeMay. Jimmy was uh, Jimmy. 
Jimmy was an icon up there at one time. Him and Clarence LeMay, they had quite the rivalry. In the early 70s, the Nelsons expanded the business closer to their dream and changed its name to Polar Raceway Park to reflect that emphasis. They quickly realized that it was a motorsports park that they wanted to build, not just a drag strip, to attract stock cars, dirt bikes, ATVs, and even snow machines. We had a, we had a circle track out there, for uh, a three-eighths of a mile circle track out there for a long time, and then we ran, we had, uh, well, we ran drag races with snow machines for a long time, in the wintertime, and then we had a two-mile close course that we ran snow machine. That's why we decided to change it to raceway instead of dragway. Because we, if you look at the brochure on there, we actually have a, uh, a two and a half mile closed course to, to race uh, Formula One type race cars. Uh, and that is, it was a road course. It wasn't just a circle circle, it was right. actual right. road course. Well, we ran snow machines on that when we found out that, that Alaska was just wasn't ready for that uh, era of racing. We had a full restaurant out there for about, um, I'd say, seven or eight years. You'd have a steak and shrimp dinner or whatever you wanted. And... The popularity of the track grew by leaps and bounds in the 70s and 80s. The muscle car era was in full swing and the Nelsons had no trouble keeping the stands and the pits full. Back in the 60s, I mean, like I said, I started back Started off at, at Ford, yeah, and I was there for pumping gas as a kid in high school. And what really got me excited was uh, there was a white Mustang come rolling through there. It was called uh, Snowbird, and uh, Gary was running it, Bodenstedt. And it had a single overhead cam, fuel injected, sock motor in it, and he come through the there and got gas and I was just a kid and I took a look at that car and thought wow when I, when I went out there and watched him of course I had my own car then but I went out and watched him I thought yeah that's what I want to do <laughs> and so I was kind of hooked at an early age. KC Hooks was just one of many locals who got hooked on drag racing at an early age. Quite a few of them raced here for most of their lives. In fact some of them are still racing today or supporting their kids and even their grandkids at the racetrack. Being sanctioned by NHRA meant there were many car classes in the 70s and 80s and everybody had their favorite. For the most part, the pro gas cars were cars. You know, they were actually door slammer. And there was Vegas, big block and small block. And uh, and there was a lot of competition for about six, seven years. That was the class out there. Pro Gas was the class to be in. In the early 80s, when the track was called Thunder Valley, they tried racing stock cars in sprints on the small dirt oval. Because of a conflict with Capital Speedway in Willow and a significant dust problem, those races lasted no more than a single season. You can see the dust blowing off the dirt track in this video. Multiple layouts were used for a variety of competitions including monster trucks but all the dirt tracks were still used in the off-season, according to this 1983 end-of-season announcement. As you see the snow working its way down the mountain, don't think that that's going to be an end to the racing because we've got a winter season here at the Polar Raceway. We'll have ATV racing, including three-wheelers, Odyssey, spike bikes, and snow machines. We'll be running ovals, course racing, and drag racing in all categories. We want you to stay tuned to Channel 2 for late October race schedules. We'll also have sanctioned three-wheelers and Odyssey qualifiers here for the Fur Rendezvous finale. Don't miss the winter action in association with the Polar ATV Invitational, which took place here oh, just a couple weeks back at the Sullivan Arena. Race, you like it, Polar Raceway, all through the winter. The excitement continued through the 80s with lots more action. Front and rear engine dragsters, alterds, 
funny cars, modifieds, street cars, and motorcycles. There were some real crowd pleasers in all the classes, but the king of the motorcycle class had to be Squeaks O'Connor. And Jimmy Trueblood, he kind of inspired me a lot to get into drag racing. I was just riding my street bike and I stopped at the drag strip one Sunday just to watch because I knew he raced and some of my customers. And uh, my street bike that I was riding around, I run like a 1083 on it, was the, the fastest bike there. So I decided this is easy, I'll just go get <laughs> drag. So that's kind of got me into drag racing and that would have been uh, uh, 1977. I really didn't get into it really big time until 1979. And built an alcohol, injected alcohol Kawasaki drag bike, and then within a couple of weeks I wasn't fast enough. I put nitromethane in it. So. <laughs> and I have a lots of fun memories from that being the right. first motorcycle to run it a nine and an eight and a seven set quarter mile. Oh, that was a big deal for me. Let's see, I run the eight 1979 and the nine in 79 and then the eight in 1979. It must have been around 84 when I run the, or 83 when I run the seven. Weeks always drew a crowd whether he was racing on the track or up in the air. By the early 90s, the dirt tracks had been shut down, but there was no shortage of cars and bikes racing on the quarter-mile paved strip. Nineteen ninety four was a landmark year for Polar Raceway Park in several ways. Thanks to the efforts of Ron Bowerman, a longtime drag racer, Team Alaska made the long haul to Hawaii in February of ninety four. Sealand Horizon gave the racers special discounted rates for shipping their cars, beginning the annual Alaska Hawaii shootout, which lasted for about ten years. Alaskans learned to race in the dark and made lasting friendships. Team Hawaii even made the trip to Alaska a few times. Mahalo. Although 1994 had been another great year on the drag strip, there were rumors that the Nelson family was thinking about getting out of the racing business. So a group of concerned racers formed Top End Incorporated with the intention of buying the track from the Nelsons. By they got to the place uh, th uh, about uh, 30 years later, we decided that we've been in this for a long time. So we decided we was gonna sell. Time to get out of it. Top End was a group of guys who got together. They all loved racing and they decided that something had to happen to this so, track. Yeah, because so. it was, Nelson was going away. The, the deal was we, we formed a corporation 
and the corporation was Top End Incorporated. And actually, Greg Gunnerson is the guy that put the, the, top, the corporation together to, to get it running, so that we, and we leased the track. In November of 1994, Top End Incorporated bought out the Nelsons and changed the track's name to Alaska Raceway Park. On March 1, 1995, the track was sanctioned by IHRA, which was considered to be more local track oriented than NHRA. Randy Harris convinced me that, you know, if we're going to keep the track going, we, we've got to, we, we've got to have, you know, somebody else with some expertise in there and stuff like that to give us a hand with it. And for 20000 you can get in on this deal and it's a super trick, you know, it's a, it's, it's a good deal. He's and, a good salesman. And the, the big thing at that time was, was not, you know, that we were going to get rich or anything like that, but it's, it was, it was a place for entertainment for the, for the kids, for the future, for, you know, high school drag racing was a big deal at that time. And, and, and uh, you know, our family, you know, I'd been into racing forever, basically, well, not forever, but for when I was, from when I was over in the military in, in the army and, and that stuff. So, you know, we've, we've done this for a, a chance to, to keep the track alive and moving. So you didn't want to see it go away? Yeah. No. Basically, to, to make it happen, to, to keep it to where, where it was an entertainment area for, for keeping the kids off the street. We could hopefully get some of the cops involved in, in Anchorage and, and bring stuff together and, and hopefully get things working to where it was a, a good, a good. It's it's a good clean sport for the for right. the kids and the, right. you know you're you're the kids that are out there at the track if if they're working on their cars and stuff they haven't got money or time to to buy drugs and and all that other crap that gets them into trouble. And, and if we can if we can do that, if we can just keep a few of these and, and off the street in good shape and, and moving forward, it's well worth it. It's worth the effort. I became the seventh member of Top End Incorporated in the middle of the 1995 racing season. Between 95 and 98, Top End completed extensive changes to the property, including installation of an entrance via Sullivan Road, environmental cleanup, adding double guardrails, new bleachers, an improved sound system, and re-roofing and sprucing up of all buildings. October, I think, of 98? He went to a meeting that was going to talk about they needed to change members of the corporation um, for a variety of reasons. And he came home and he said, how would you like to own a racetrack? And I said, I already, we already do. And he says, no, how would you like to own the whole thing? And I said, I wouldn't. And he says, well, you do now. In the fall of 1998, Karen and I bought the corporate stock from the other shareholders. We eventually split some stock with our daughter, Michelle Lackey Mayer. Improvements continued, including new bleachers on the pit site. After the relatively new roof on the main building blew off, Russ Hattenberg installed a new pitched roof. Because of extensive water damage, the main building also went through a complete renovation, including gutting and upgrading the lounge and adding a viewing deck. A gift shop was added and the garage was enlarged. More pavement in the pits and a new entry gate for racers was built. After the 1999 racing season, it was obvious something had to be done with the track surface. It had been through 35 winters and thousands of rounds of racing, including fully loaded snap-on tool trucks. The track was just, it was just going away. It was just pretty much gone. We, the, the starting line was, was breaking apart. Fortunately, there were more than a few racers at the track who could help with the repaving project. With Mac and Rex McKee from Vico, Ray Martin with Denali Concrete, Jerry Andrews, the training instructor for the 302 operating engineers, 
and many other skilled volunteers, this project was expedited. The plan was to remove all of the old track surface, install heated concrete for the first 300 feet, and then lay down 4,100 feet of asphalt. The new track was not only going to be longer, but wider. We'd worked with the operating engineers and uh, <coughs> worked with Mac and Rex over the winter and managed to get, uh, you know, to, to kind of go over stuff of what needed to be done and get everything lined up. And, and they brought a bunch of equipment out and then uh, the operating engineers had been, uh, Jerry was, was the, the trainer for the operating engineers. And, and he was, he was the, the big guy on that end of the program. And, and we worked with him and we worked with Kenny Pelletier who was out at the, at the batch plant mixing, mixing asphalt. Oh, and Sorrow sponsored it. <coughs> that was the beginning of our relationship, relationship with, with Sorrow. Is they, they paid for the asphalt, the uh, emulsion. For the operating engineers to do a project, most of their projects wind up being like a parking lot at a church or something like that. They, they don't have any big projects. And they wanted to do a a senior training program, a, a elite training program for the for the top operators in the state, and they really they really needed a, a bigger project like that, and they were excited about working with us, and and they, you know, Vico was buying a lot of stuff and, and hiring a lot of their their train their trainees and, and things of that nature, so we kind of worked out the deal where. Uh, I paid for all the all the fuel, all the the operating costs of their their equipment, and they furnished the manpower and the technology and the machinery. The final grading was done. Uh, Miller Construction was M M M and B. I think it was M B Construction was the big guys at that time, and they had just bought a brand new cat uh, asphalt uh, machine with with the lasers on it, with all the laser technology on it. And and they set that up. They they had done the final layout with, with the lasers with the graders. And then they set up with the with the paving machine and they, they went right off the end of the concrete and, and laid that out as it's within half a percent center to the outside and half a percent from the back front to, from the starting line to the finish line. It's half a percent drop. Denali concrete uh, Ray Martin. Uh, we talked with uh, Northern uh, Plumbing and Heating, I think it is, I guess it's just Northern Plumbing and Heating, uh, on, on laying out the, the grid and the boiler system for the track heat. And we, we laid that all out and uh, Denali Concrete, Ray Martin had his guys come out and we we leveled and laid that all out and, and put the, the launch pads in. As long as we had these resources at hand, we also paved the remaining gravel section of Sullivan Road that led to our pit entrance. In, in 2000, when we paved the track, we paved that's when Sullivan. Sullivan we paved it from the from the from the from the bridge to the to the pit entrance. The guys that that did that paved our track uh, <clears throat> we had we got a hold of the borough and uh, the borough split the cost of the paving and for the not the not the laying it down but the cost of the asphalt they split the cost of the asphalt with me and and we paved it so that we had we had asphalt going all the way down past the, the pit entrance so we paved from the bridge to the pit entrance in June of that same year, we installed new scoreboards and finished installing a new timing system. Shortly after purchasing the assets of Top End, we realized that there were some property line issues that had to be rectified. Where they put the driveway in is between two lots, and they didn't own either lot. Where my ticket booth is and where the shop is, 
that property across the front belonged to other people. The shop was built partially on other people's land. Well, no, the, the shop was totally on, on the other property. On the, on the other property. Yeah. So we ended up having to buy the 10 acres across the front of the property, the stuff on Sullivan Road, yeah. because the building was already on it. We, no, when you we say bought, we, do you mean top end or? No, Karen. Or, or, or on that. Cool. This is, yeah. We, we bought those two pieces of property uh, in like 96 or 7. We were part of, of Top End, but we before we bought the other guys out. When Nelson Scott property, it was on a 55-year lease from the Department of Natural Resources. And when Top End was formed, they took over the lease from Nelson's. They bought out Nelson's physical property, you know, the buildings and things, yeah. but the land was still leased from the state. Mm -hmm. After we got it, Earl and I, we realized that leasing it from the state didn't really work because you had nothing that you could mortgage. It was it never any deal, it was sooner or later or something. You, you, were going, you were going to have to own it because you couldn't borrow money against the land that you didn't own. So we approached the Department of Natural Resources about turning the lease into a purchase. Another issue with the property was the spectator parking lot. The, the spectator parking area, that that totally belonged to the borough. That didn't that wasn't part of the property or well, anything the, like the that. State leased land. It was it was never leased, it was never anything done on they it. They just they just parked there. Right. They just used it. And so that's when we started once once we found out you know between then and as we got later on we found out that we needed to do some we needed to purchase some of the property so then they they finally decided to to sell us the 27 acres that we got over there uh, as as parking lot what we had to do was we had to go in and get a, a certified state appraiser to go over and put a Put an actual number on the property as to what it was worth, and we and that was the, the number that we could the, buy it for. Them. The appraisal book is about that thing. They went after. I mean, they looked yeah, into everything, and they came up with a number and said to the DNR, "This is what it's worth." And then DNR could say, "All right, we'll sell it to you." or we'll keep the lease. And they chose to, offer, to agree to, to our purchasing it. It was also discovered that the main building was sitting in the section line easement. At, at the same time that we were putting the final deal together with the state, we, we took the easement from the west side, which was a section line easement, and moved that over to the, to the east side of the track. And, and there's, there's 60 foot, First of all, of that, that's the easement, and then there's another 200 feet that, that we got to leave for the because we're too noisy. Yeah, so there's that's a buffer it's... between us and Jim Creek. I'm not sure why a noise buffer is needed on the east side, which borders the Connect River Public Use Area, which encompasses 260,000 acres of recreational land, since it creates plenty of its own noise. On April 28, 2003, the 155-acre State of Alaska lease was patented and conveyed to Top End Incorporated, the first private party to own the land. Now, Top End could mortgage the land if necessary to continue improvements. Also, in 2003, IHRA recognized all of that work and honored Alaska Raceway Park as Track of the Year for showing positive growth and success on the track. By this time, ARP had been featured in numerous racing publications, Super Chevy, Drag Illustrated, Drag Review, Alaska Sports Magazine, National Dragster, and Hot Rod. Here are just a handful of the racers that came up from outside to run down the new drag strip. Tony Foti with the LAPD 
Racing Team. Ron Fossil, AA Fuel Alter, who competed against the Alaska Grizzly. Jet Cars from Canada. Silver Fox. A jet tanker and a modified tank. Rolling Thunder. The kid's favorite. Tomator, Jet Tow Truck. And Ricky Reese with his double-A fuel altered Nevada Rattler. Those jet cars really heated up our Alaska racing scene. So, it would seem that the new surface on the track brought out quite a few more fast cars and even snow machines. Racers had a good track now so they could work on getting more horsepower to the pavement. Alaska Raceway Park was also being discovered as a great location to shoot commercials and even the occasional Hollywood feature. Filming Top Gear was an experience, including building a breakaway barrier. I gotta tell you, I, I travel around a lot, I work a lot of tracks, I get to see, I've never seen a more beautiful track, but more importantly, I've never seen not everybody get along as much as you guys do. There's always some argument, there's someone bitching about something, there's always a fight somewhere, and this has been a wonderful thing to watch. So was hosting celebrities like Big Schwag Beidner. Like Big Schwag, anyone who spends any amount of time at ARP soon realizes that this track has something special going for it. It's the ARP family. As far as the ARP family is concerned, I, th I think what they're talking about is the the camaraderie, the the feeling, the 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 fact that you know. It, the ARP family is, is the Mahawkas, the Jeanettes, the, the Roloffs, the, the guys that are, that are out there. The, <coughs> the Harrises. That, yeah. The that, Childs. Yeah. That are, that are all part of the organization that Keith help us McDonald's. put it together. We, we kind of, we handle the finances of the program, but it's, 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 a, it's a family organization. It's not, it's not our family. It's not, not the Lackey family. It's the... The ARP family is what, what you're saying. There, is that, there's a lot of very deep, extended network yeah. of friendships yeah. out there. Um, people who come to visit our track from elsewhere to race with us always comment about the fact that, that these guys you know, get along yeah. so well, that they're so friendly and so helpful. And, and, and you see it a lot. You know, Somebody will break something. And somebody will be, well, I've yeah. got this in my trailer. You can use it for today so that you can keep on racing. Right. They're in the same class. They're going after each other for points. Right. And this guy's giving him a part so he can, right. if he sat yeah. it out all day, he wouldn't get his points. And they, ta just... they take new racers under their wing and, and, and show them how to do it and tell them, you know, teach them all the stuff that they've learned the hard way. Yeah. And we're, you know, and we have a lot of people out there racing who are, you know, third generation now. Yeah, um, and and you know it is, and his spouse is racing together, and it's 
parents with their kids running the juniors. And, and, and a couple of generations of people that live in the Butte that work for us. Besides being a good employer in the area, ARP is continually striving to give back to the community, like colony days, and whenever possible, they are there to support numerous charities, including the Muscular Dystrophy Association, Covenant House, the Shriners, and many more. While Top End was sprucing up ARP in the late 90s, A.J. Swichtenberg was building North Star Speedway, a quarter mile paved oval less than 20 miles away near the intersection of the Glen Highway and the Parks Highway. Shortly after North Star opened, things became complicated. Borough regulations regarding such properties were vague and the group Friends of Matsu was very vocal in their opposition to the track. South Central Alaska, a group led by Lund Larson, bought North Star in 2000, but the borough placed racetracks on the list of businesses that required conditional use permit. In 2006, after some ups and downs in the controversy, racetrack supporters thought they had found a compromise when a group of investors suggested moving the oval track to property adjacent to the Alaska Raceway Park drag strip. That should have made everybody happy. When Michelle Church, a borough assembly member, was approached with the idea, she said she would only agree to moving ARP drag strip and North Star Oval to Point McKenzie. North Star continued to race through 2011 and officially closed in 2012. Since North Star no longer operated its paved oval, it seemed time to resurrect Lee Nelson's plan for an oval next to the drag strip. The, the paved oval had been coming for 05, 06, something like that. Uh, when AJ built his track, and then they were they were having trouble uh, with the neighbors. Yeah, the neighbors' ordinances and stuff on that order, and AJ had left, uh, and and Lud Larson had, had bought the main interest in the in the little North Star Speedway, and that was that was pretty well set up and and working, but. There was a lot of controversy. We were at, at a borough uh, Butte Community Council meeting and, and Britt has, has, was the secretary at that time and, and they, the, the question was, you know, are you going to build an oval track out there? And I said, I'd, I'd be crazy. I said, I'm, I'm never going to build an oval track as long as the others, as long as North Star is going. But they forgot the last part of it. Yeah, yes. yeah she, didn't, she didn't include the whole statement. In, in her program, but but that was the the whole deal. I was never going to, never I had no intention of. It. And then when they got into trouble and they and they had the it wound up with the hospital on one side and the, the subdivision and the, the school on the other side of their track. And then Lud died. Right. Yeah. And then your son Michael died. That was the final. But they but that's at off. at that point is when we first asked the borough if they you know if we could. If we could, you know, work out a deal to where North Star went away, and we built the oval out at, at our place, and, right. and we started pushing it at that point to get it done, and it kind of went away, and it came and went away, and then we finally uh, got the authorization.
Construction began almost immediately after Burl loosened racetrack regulations and approved the oval. Plans had been made with the knowledge that this was going to happen sooner or later. With help from major sponsors, trees were felled, overburden removed, dirt moved. By spring of 2015, the oval was taking shape. Walls were poured and the gravel base compacted, allowing it to settle over the winter. But John Akers and Pete Madison kept busy erecting the metal puzzle, which became the bleachers. Early spring found them constructing ticket booths, shops, and the announcer's tower. After the frost was gone, paving began on an oval bank up to 12%. Fencing, scoreboard, and track stand rounded out the project. The track opened June 4, 2016 with an awesome turnout of fans and racers present despite a chilly day. NASCAR had sanctioned the track before it even opened. NASCAR rep Kevin Nevelanian braved Alaska's January weather to walk the snowy track and finalize the sanction. To facilitate building the one-third mile paved oval, ARP needed to mine some gravel. It used the 27-acre parcel which had been purchased from the borough back in 2003. They would also mine gravel in the future as part of an agreement with Dana Pruse, whose company, Pruse Construction, was building the track. As it turned out, getting the conditional use permit for the gravel pit was more of a challenge than getting approval to build the oval. The next couple of years were very exciting on both tracks and came with a bit of learning curve on the oval. The NASCAR track was immediately very popular with racers and fans alike, so much so that additional spectator parking area and pit expansions were added to the list of future improvements to be made. Our daughter Michelle has been active in the drag race operation since early 2000, as well as being a championship snow machine racer. After moving to Fairbanks, she made the nearly 350 mile trip to ARP 
too many times to count every summer. Once the NASCAR track opened, she had to be at the track every race day since she was the lady track boss who kept that side of the operation running smoothly. In 2018, she and her family moved back to the Palmer area and immediately gained two days a week by eliminating the commute. Little by little, she was taking over the drag strip operation as well. In October of 2019, the drag strip returned to sanctioning by NHRA. For over 20 years, the season opener on the drag strip has been on Mother's Day. 2020 was going to be very different. ARP, Alaska, and the world was coping with the COVID-19 pandemic. ARP's community spirit kicked in immediately when it became known that COVID would prevent high schools from holding traditional ceremonies for their graduates. ARP's NASCAR track seemed like the perfect place for students to celebrate their graduation while practicing social distancing. With COVID numbers fairly low in the Matsu, there were few restrictions on activities at the track. Unable to locate COVID mitigation procedures from NASCAR or NHRA, Michelle produced her own and racing went on, although with safety precautions in place. It would appear that race fans needed their fix. Because the Alaska State Fair was canceled in 2020, ARP teamed up with local promoters to host the Matsu Summerfest on the NASCAR track side. It was a large, safe, and secure open-air venue with good food and good local music talent. Since assuming management of the tracks, Michelle has broadened the scope of ARP to include many venues that provide good exposure for the park, including car shows, amusement rides, open-air rock and country concerts. Even though the track has been in existence for more than 57 years, lots of folks still have been heard to say, I never knew there was a racetrack out here. She is marketing aggressively to change that view. When the NHRA sanctioned the drag strip in 2019, Part of the agreement was that the existing guardrails would be replaced with concrete barriers which have proven to be much safer for drivers and spectators. Michelle started Club 1320 to give ownership to the project to individuals who could buy in for just $100. That project started in fall of 2021 with the removal of the old guardrails. 2022 was off to an early and hectic start since the project had to be completed before the season opened. Michelle lent a hand at Edgy. Snow was still evident when the racer Monty Soper's crew labored diligently to pour the walls. John Lackey, Rick Nissen, Corey Ricks, and other volunteers installed a replacement for the 20-year-old timing system plus improved Wi-Fi system. Racer Kirk Crocker painted the walls and racer Steve Lord fabricated the scoreboard. All had to be done between breakup and Mother's Day. Whew. Obviously, this is an ongoing story. The park is in excellent hands, and hopefully the story will never end, at least until there is no longer a need for speed.